So now, let me welcome the great panelists to the stage, starting with... Don Stewart, the CEO of the Educational Division of News Corporation, Joel Klein, Teach for America alum, a hero of the city of New Orleans and many other places, Dave Levin, another Teach for America alum and the hero of the city of the District of Columbia, Michelle Ree. Superman. <laughs> the founder and the CEO of the Harlem Children's Zone, Jeff Canada. And the superintendent elect of the Los Angeles, soon to be unified school district, John Dacey. Thank you all very much. First, you may have missed this in the applause and music, but the first speaker, Joel Klein, Chancellor of New York Public Schools for nine years, has made some of the most important progress we've seen citywide. I'm gonna ask a question to the five of you, and the framing is this. Yesterday, in Egypt, a revolution happened, a transformation of the future of Egypt. <laughs> Following, similar in Tunisia. The, even led by a diverse coalition with a younger generation at the center. What happens next is unclear. But the even bigger question now for the people of Egypt, people of Tunisia, is how to utilize and exercise the power and responsibility they have won to create a better society in Egypt, Tunisia, the Middle East, and the world. Today, we have, as Wendy Kopp has helped make possible, and you all have helped make possible, what I had called a once-in-a-generation opportunity to transform outcomes for youth, especially low-income youth in this country. My former boss, President Clinton's former education secretary, Dick Riley, 50-year public servant, corrected me, said, no, this is a once-in-three-generation opportunity. He's never seen an opportunity this great to transform outcomes for kids. So I'd like to start with um, former Chancellor Joel Klein, and we'll go down the panel for no more than two minutes each so we can get through a lot of questions in this panel. What makes this such an unusual and historic opportunity? And what is the single most important thing you think that this group, this country needs to do to seize and not squander that opportunity in the next 10 years? Joel. Well, thank you, John. So, first of all, I think the question is, is this our Egypt moment? We come together never more impressive 11,000 people in this room. I congratulate Wendy, my colleagues. But the real question is, will we seize the moment, or will we, as we often do, talk to each other, feel good, go home, and think we've accomplished something important? And I challenge us to make this our Egypt moment, folks, because our country cannot wait. What's different now? Two things are different. One, unlike when I started a decade ago, we now no longer believe that poverty is destiny. We actually believe because of the work of people inside this room and elsewhere that we can educate kids to an entirely different level. So the excuse that we used to permeate our culture is no longer there. Second of all, everybody now understands the future of this country depends on getting entirely different educational outcomes. Whatever short-term issues we face, this is America's issue. And it's not just perceived in this room, from the president on down. And the real question, what will change it? It's quite simple. Each one of you insists that every single school out there is a school you'll send your kids to. Until you have that, then it doesn't work. Whose kids should go to the schools your kids don't go to? And I'll tell you whose kids go to those schools. They're children of color and they're children of poverty in America. So it's quite simple. How we get there depends on taking Wendy's paradigm one step further. To hell with incremental change, forget about transformational change. We need radical change in K-12 education. So, Dave Levin stands on the platform having created transformative results in the schools that he leads in New York and KIPP schools around the country. 
Now the question is, how does that go to big scale? Why is this such a moment of opportunity, and what is the most important this group and this nation needs to do to seize the moment? Yep. Uh, thanks, John, and, 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 and I agree with Joel. I think the opportunity is now because we know it's possible. There is no longer any doubt that transformation, revolutionary schools can exist in every single neighborhood in this country, regardless of demographics. We know it's possible. At KIPP, we've quadrupled the low-income college, graduate, college graduation rate in the nation. We've exceeded the national average across all demographic groups. It can no longer be doubted that great schools can be built. But the revolution will not happen without more great schools. Simply put, it will not happen without more great schools. And great schools will not exist without great principals and without great teachers. And so, and so for the folks here, I, I, I will take Joel's request one step further. For the folks here, each and every one of us have to answer this question. What can we best do to serve the revolution? And if you out there can be a great principal, if you out there can be a great teacher, if that's what you wake up in the morning thinking about, then that's what this revolution needs for as long as you can humanly do it, because there will be no revolution without great public schools. Michelle. Michelle, Michelle you, you came in and DC was one of those cities that people said was historically dysfunctional and never could improve or succeed. DC is now one, maybe the most improved city in the country in terms of achievement, according to the NAEP urban trials. You stand on that platform. What's the nature of this moment and what's the most important thing that can be done to seize it? I think what makes this moment different, and I've been in this game for 20 years now, and I, I think that we are at a place that I've, I've never seen before in terms of the ability to really, really push forward. Uh, I think a part of it is that that education reform has now hit the mainstream, right? So for 20 years, you had people like Dave and Jeffrey uh, out there sort of in their individual schools doing amazing work and they'd have to try to convince some rich person to bring their couple of their friends in to hear about and see what they were doing. Now we've hit the mainstream with Waiting for Superman and NBC's Education Nation, normal everyday people not that we're not normal, but normal everyday people are actually beginning to understand what's at stake and what's happening. And if I have to hear one more person as I'm out visiting state legislatures say, well, we just need a proof point. We need to know what works. And then if we knew what worked, then we would replicate it. And I always say, no, we already know what works. If you look at KIPP, if you look at HCC, if you look at all the, we know what works. We just don't want to do it. It, I mean, this is the, this is the reality. It, this is hard stuff. So I think I think the moment is now, and and you know, for for the eleven thousand people who are in the room, we can we can sort of go one of two ways. We can think, okay, you know, we've got to sort of figure out how to you know all get together and 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 come to agreement on how we're going to move forward and, and that sort of thing, which I think for 30 years has not served us particularly well. Or we can take this movement to really lean forward into this and say, you know what, not everybody is going to be with us, not everybody is going to like us, but unless we, we, we are aggressive right now and are willing to do this, knowing that some, some opposition and some controversy might arise, <laughs> then I do not think that we are going to be able to take advantage of this moment. So I think it's a matter of whether the 11,000 people in this room are willing to take this mantle right now and go. Jeff. Jeff. <laughs> you too stay on the, plat on the platform of dramatic results you've achieved for kids in the Harlem Children's Zone. By the way, I do hope you see a clear pattern here, is that the fact that these are some of the most important education reform leaders in the country is based on the fact they've all produced dramatic results in the systems and schools that they're in. So as you all are producing those results, in the, for those of you who are in your schools, and in your classrooms, and in your school systems, most importantly, you're driving change for the kids you're serving, but it also equips you more than nothing else could to understand and then be effective in advocating for what's needed. Jeff, you've done that. What's the nature of this moment of opportunity, and what's the most important thing that can be done? So 
uh, first of all, uh, I think that this is a unique time uh, in our uh, country's history around this issue of education. And if you've been involved in this as long as I have, uh, I never thought I would see this moment, right? Uh, this is one of those things that I thought, you know, I thought we would go down fighting for the cause. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of romantic, you know, like, yeah, the final breath. You know, you don't win anything, but, you know, people say, yeah, boy, he died well, right? That sort of thing. Uh, but now I'm thinking we could really win, right? This is like, this is a new, this is a new thing, right? So, so, so this is, this is where I think the, the challenge is, and you've mentioned Egypt, and it's been on my mind a long time, uh, because if you look at the last time, I think a whole bunch of us from this country came together publicly around an issue. In my lifetime, it was civil rights. And it, that didn't happen in one or two years. And we didn't go away. People didn't fight for like a year or two and didn't say, okay, we didn't really get the law passed, so let's, let's I mean, people stayed with this thing year after, and it grew every single year more intense, and they would sit down and think, I wonder what they're doing next year. I mean, it was really bad. The, 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 the thing that I am most afraid about, right, is that this momentum, that this is the height of it. That, that from here on in, people say, okay, Michelle's out there, go Michelle, you know. But I don't personally have to do anything more dramatic next year than I did this year. Uh, we have to understand that as a nation, we've become soft around fighting for what we believe in. Uh, that that issue, and, 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 and let, me just, let me just say a second, just to define, I was up at Wesleyan uh, at the university, a lot of Black History Month stuff's going on, Wesleyan grads out there high. Uh, but they had a picture, they had a, a videotape of when Dr. King came to Wesleyan. He went to Wesleyan about three or four times. And I listened to Dr. King say in this like two minute thing, some of us are gonna die. He said, some of us are gonna die. And we gotta know that's the price that we pay if we're gonna change this nation. And I sat there and I got chills. And I said, look, I've been worried about the New York Times writing a negative article about me, right? You know what I'm saying? So how soft is that, right? This guy is talking about the ultimate price and are we prepared to it. So my challenge to all of us is we gotta understand that this is really like war. That, that, that whatever we've done this year is really nothing. It's about what we plan to do and when the call came in to me, I got a call, uh, and, and, and I actually liked the person, I got a call from a, a union leader who said, Jeff, now that that wait is, for Superman thing is over, uh, let's talk. And if you, I don't know, it was like the Batman movie where the, the, the Joker comes and say, where did they get a load of me? I was thinking, where did they get a load of you all? This thing is just starting, this thing is not over. So I think we got to ratchet this up. So we're gonna, um, we're going to keep moving. We've got a, a lot of issues and incredible insight here. We're going to get into issues of systems change, the nature of leadership, teachers' unions, other things. Before we go into a lot of specifics, John Dacey, you are about to take the helm of the third largest, second largest school system in the country. People say about Los Angeles what they said about D.C. and New York before Michelle Reed took over the schools in D.C. and Joe Klein took over the schools in New York. It's not possible. This is dysfunctional. If you could talk about for the country and or Los Angeles, what is the nature of this historic opportunity and what is the most important thing that can be done in order to seize that? Um, thank you. First thing I just want to say very quickly, is anybody in this room who is taught a youth in Prince George's County, Maryland or LA, thank you very much. Don't tell me it can't be done in LA because your proof points, two of them are sitting right inside of the room. So you can't tell me this is not possible in Los Angeles. And you also can't tell me that we're not willing to die for the cause. For me, dying for the cause is turning our back on a youth who lives in circumstances of poverty in Los Angeles. One of our kids who lives under the freeway, one of our kids who has no parent, that is not gonna be possible. We know it can be done. This is really an issue around courage. Um, we have the skill. Um, how courageous are we going to be about the work? I think about the issues that lay in front of us 
And many of these issues are going to be um, very risky. And if 11,000 people descended on LA to press for a cause, you can't turn back from that. The system, and I mean we are connected with our labor partners and the administration, needs to be pressed to a point where it works for kids and for the teachers in this room. It actually can't be a prevention any longer. It actually must work. And systems only work when they're pressed against very hard around that issue. So I think the idea is we go back to our places and we do great work in small cities. There is a power of the collective as we think about descending on cities en masse that I think is, is, is significant around that. So let me just follow up, John. I mean, you too stand on the platform of the transformative results you've achieved leading tr in tremendous reform in Prince George's County, your work at the Gates Foundation elsewhere. You're now arriving in Los Angeles. There, are, I bet, are some people in this room who are in Los Angeles. Yep. In Los Angeles, could you describe, and by extension, you can, you can imagine what is needed in other communities around the country. Right. For all the TFA alum, the core members and others in Los Angeles, as you embark on the superintendency, what do you need from them in order to drive success in Los Angeles at scale over the next several years? So a couple of things. Um, en masse, come and join New Day in LA. I think that's very, very important. We can't just have what we have in the room. We need three or four times those numbers um, to come. Second of all is, raise your voice as loud as possible about that we will not allow rules, regulations, and the system to put at peril high quality teaching at any expense. And we will not stand up for, even if they're currently conventional rules that say that youth who live in circumstances of poverty get the least prepared, the poorest conditions, and the most highly mobile schools. That is not okay for adults. We are facing uh, serious and legitimate ways to think about not allowing that to happen for kids. It can't be one person, it can't be just a school board, no matter how courageous those things can be. The movement needs an organization to respond to it. Don't allow it not to happen. That would be one thing I would need. And then the third thing is be relentless about sticking around to help us out. This is not going to be quick. It's interesting, the, uh, <laughs> on the Egypt analogy, this, in some ways, that what happens next is the most important in Egypt. Yeah. How do people use the responsibility and power to drive success? And the way the message is here, how do people in this room use responsibility and power that you've got in your classrooms, your schools, your school systems, your advocacy organizations, in order to drive the kind of transformative success that we now have seen demonstrably true at small scale in pockets of schools, a few school systems making gains, but overall our performance as a country, as people know, is flat. The U.S. used to be number one in the world in education. We had wild inequities that were awful. We still were number one. We now have slipped to the middle of a pack among industrialized nations, and that's because we've stayed flat while some other countries are moving ahead, and our inequities have only closed this much. At the core of that, there is an insight that's being talked about here that I want to address very explicitly and hear from at least a couple of you on, which is the question about what is the power of high-quality education to transform poverty and lift kids out of poverty. In the 1960s, Wendy referred to the Coleman Report, described at a time when there weren't many effective educational interventions, that essentially the quality of educational outcomes was a, di a function of family background and socioeconomic status. M most people in this country believe, there are surveys that showed most people in the country believe the biggest contributors to low achievement are lack of student motivation, family backgrounds, parental involvement. One quote I'll give you, uh, uh, probably here in this audience, Teach for America alumni, Colorado State Senator Mike Johnston, co-founder with me of New Leaders for New Schools, led a incredible reform effort that you know about in Colorado to transform the laws of Colorado this year to along the lines that you're talking about to ensure excellence, accountability, greatness for teachers and leaders based on the notion that great teachers and leaders can be accountable for achievement. Let me read a quote. There was a lawmaker who was opposing the reforms that in the end, Senator Johnston, Teach for America alum, prevailed with a diverse coalition, civil rights groups, business groups, educators, the AFT affiliate even came on in the end, supported this, the NEA didn't. Um, the quote from a lawmaker who's opposing this kind of a notion of excellence and accountability for educators, for low-income kids, said, and I quote, if you were running a business baking bread and the flour came to you full of maggots, 
and worms, you would not be able to produce a good product, would you? That was the quote. He apologized later. He realized how bad that sounded. <laughs> he realized he shouldn't have said it that way. But he said, in fact, what that person believed. And I would wager what many, many people in this country still believe. So before we get to the strategy, which we'll get to in the systems change, a moment on that. What would you say to that lawmaker and Americans who believe the Coleman Report means that education is a function of poverty? What have you seen that really refutes that, that is the basis for the work moving forward? Dave Levin? <laughs> That's what we've done. I mean, it's just wrong. I mean, the, 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 the fact of the matter is we have seen transformative public schools in low-income neighborhoods offer kids the opportunity to transform. It's just not true, right? What we have also learned is that one year is not enough. So schools have to make, there's an implicit promise when a kid comes to school that it should change their life. That promise is broken in America. And we as a society have to understand it's pre-K, 12, through college and beyond. This idea that we're gonna stop somewhere, in a, smart eighth graders don't, I mean, smart eighth graders don't get a job, right? So as, as a society, we can't join the, if, if, if you're teaching, if you're running a school, it is not about the one year, the four years, the 12 years, it's about the rest of your life. And so we have seen countless kids whose society would, would have written off uh, go to and through college. So that argument's just wrong. So the biggest point is it's actually demonstrably untrue. It's which, just not true. Which Wendy said, you said 20 years ago, there were maybe a couple very isolated classroom schools, but this is significant. Schools like yours and others out there that have made that point demonstrably untrue, even if people don't believe it. John Dacey. I'm going to paraphrase a quote to start with. To the lawmakers and the people who want to hang on to the notion of Coleman, you get the right to your opinion, you just don't get the right to your own facts. The facts are that we have proof points in this country which show that not only is poverty not destiny, but those people who happen to believe they're wrong are our parents and our kids. They know that there's an opportunity. They are begging for that opportunity. They demand that opportunity, no matter what conditions they live in. So the opportunity that sits in front of us is not so much whether we want to believe this or not believe in this. We know that that doesn't fly in the face of facts. The issue is we must simply say this law, this rule, this piece of contract language does not serve youth. End of story. End of story on that piece. And then overturn it. Let's make this a very short discussion. <laughs> we give the kids with the greatest challenges the crummiest education, and then we say poverty is destiny. Right. If you take those same kids, give them a different education, you get different outcomes. Yeah. Ask these guys, they're doing it. So when, it, when people say 70% of outcome is poverty, they don't hold constant the quality of the education. So if the quality of the education is no good, you know pretty much what the outcomes are gonna be. And it's, it's time for us to stop making excuses. You know, the greatest comfort when I was chancellor would have been to be able to say, there's only a little bit we can do for kids, and then say we did a little bit and declare victory. The hardest thing in the world is to know the gap between what we accomplished and what we needed and could have accomplished is still so powerful and dramatic. And until we own that gap, yeah. we will never close it. And as long as we say that the ingredients we get are no good, so the cake we bake won't be very good, we'll continue to fail at it. Well, what, one last question on this, and then we're gonna move to other topics. How, because um, I could say that there's a, my observation is this panel in this room is perhaps unified, maybe more than anything else, about this point that our kids in poverty demonstrably achieve at high, adults when, at high levels when we adults get it right. And that is not shared by many people in the country. Then there'd be different strategy tactics and want to get into some of those, but that is a un uniting conviction based on fact. How important is it, this is not a leading question, I mean, there may be different views on this. How important is it to drive success in this country, in Los Angeles specifically, for example, to, to change parents, educators, the public's conception of that fact in order to drive change of scale. There may be a theory, you know what, we're, that's not gonna be something that changes for us, so we gotta win and prevail despite that, or you might say it's crucial, and if it is crucial, what's gonna change that conception 
that impedes much of our progress. Jeff? Well, look, I, 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 I couldn't agree more with what David and what Joel have said about this issue. Uh, there is a fundamental belief, and by the way, the 11,000 people in this room may believe that, but I would not say that the average American is prepared to believe that you can get high achieving results from young people who come from very challenged yes. family backgrounds. Uh, and, and you get this sense that we shouldn't necessarily worry if those kids aren't doing well because we understand why, right? We kind of, there's a science that actually has been developed. I used to study it in school about why these kids can't learn. I mean, we had people with lots of PhDs proving that every day, and of course, then the results proved them out, right? They say, well, you know, look, these kids don't learn, and here are the reasons they don't learn. I think those of us who are in the business of disproving that issue are saying a different thing to America. We're saying in America that we reject the fact that as professional educators, that we discriminate against kids based on who their parents are or where they live or what the environments are around them. I'm an educator. I am educated. I am paid to educate a child whether that mother is deeply engaged or that mother is not. And, and, and when we accept this as professionals, then you have to educate everybody. The, the ability to say, I'm an educator and I educate all the kids who come to me prepared to, to receive what I have, that allows us to fail our children all over this country, and you will find that this is a big lift we are going to have to do in America. And the, I think the thing that people are the maddest about for all of us up here is that we are saying that I don't care what the environment of that child is. I don't care if it's gangs, I don't care if it's drugs, I don't care if they're single parents, I don't care whether the parents don't speak English, I don't care if the parents don't even like their kid. When that kid comes to me, that kid's gonna get an education because that's what I'm paid for. Yeah, Michelle. interesting over the last just even six months is the the fact that in this country there's a sort of overwhelming uh, sentiment that the reason why poor minority kids who are living in the inner city aren't doing better educationally is because of their parents right their parents aren't involved their parents aren't invested in, in the last few weeks what we we have seen through waiting for Superman you saw thousands of parents poor inner city parents who were waiting in a lottery to get their kids, wait, willing to travel two hours a day on the train to get their kid into a decent school, right? You have a, a group of parents in Compton who decided to pull the California parent trigger and organize themselves to demand that the school was turned around. And you have a mother in Akron who decided that she was going to falsify documents to send her kids to a better school. Oh, wait a second. Have each of those groups of parents been treated? We tell the first group, tough luck. You, you, we don't have enough space for your children. We, say, we tell this group, we, we, they, 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 were, they were harassed, they were intimidated, they were threatened with deportation, and now they're being told, oh wait, we didn't like the way you were being involved, so we're gonna change that rule. And we throw this lady in jail. So how do we expect as a system you know, more parents to get involved when the parents who are willing to get involved basically are told, we actually don't want your involvement. I think all of those cases basically show that it's not really, I mean, not that, I mean, some parents are involved, some parents aren't involved. We can't put all of the blame on one thing or the other. The bottom line is we have to think, we have to sort of change the perception. I think instead of saying, you know, parents aren't involved and that's why kids aren't learning, when we have, uh, examples like this where they are, we have to say, clearly we know that that's not the only issue and get at what is. So we've talked about, we've talked about where we've come, what are the most important things moving forward to seize the opportunity. We've talked about, sometimes can be skipped over, but the core conviction in fact base that supports this movement, the potential of all of our kids to achieve our levels one another with transformative leadership to change systems to get that right. Some of that conversation was happening 10 years ago. There might have been a, we all were in conversations 10 years ago where we would have said that's true and we're beginning to see a smaller number of schools. Now the number of schools has grown dramatically in classrooms. Some systems are beginning to move the ball. We've got political leaders in both parties who are championing this. So there's been some movement, but overall the performance at scale of most systems in the country hasn't moved yet. 
Um, so we've, we see reasons for hope, but the question of going from the school level successes we're seeing to successes really at scale, not just incremental and good, but dramatic, maybe one of the most important challenges. Joel, what's it gonna take to go from the KIPs and the district schools that are succeeding to some good gains in New York and DC to the kind of breakthrough gains at scale in cities that we've seen at the individual school level? Well, it's, it's gonna take a lot of things. It's gonna take real leadership, like the kind of thing you see here, guys like Jeff and Dave doing the work, the people here. But let me, let me tell you one thing it's gonna take. It's gonna take teachers who understand that their only job is not simply to teach, as important as that is. They have got to become advocates for their clients and their kids, and we cannot have teachers' unions be a monopoly voice for teacher voice. Teachers have got to be the voice in this game. In New York now, we've got a group called Educators for Excellence, and I really salute those. God bless you guys, because it's not easy. You're out there, and you guys are really kicking butt and keep doing that because, let me tell you, if we don't champion those kids, just think about it this way. If I assigned your kids in this room, and you're the most privileged people in this country, if I assigned your kids randomly to schools in LA, New York, or DC, you'd become a revolutionary. You wouldn't tolerate it for your kid. Well, just think of those kids in your classroom, in your school, mm -hmm. in your community as your kids and insist. And don't be afraid to speak, speak out. If it makes you a little unpopular with your colleagues, tough. People used to call me all the time and say, Michelle Reed, she's too aggressive. Tone her down. You know, I'm supposed to be like her big daddy. <laughs> Tone her down a little bit, right? So first of all, I called the boss and I said, look, if they're calling me, they're calling you. And the day she tones down, I'm going to tell you to get a new chancellor in D.C. Tone it up. Let's stop pretending. Let's stop feeling comfortable as adults. Those of you who know what's right have got to speak up for these kids. And you've got to take on more responsibilities. Go beyond being principals. Go on to be school leaders. Run organizations. Innovate. Change. Get involved in a political discussion. But most of all, don't let the big interests dominate this discussion. And don't buy into this notion that if all the adults collaborate, it'll be just fine for the kids. The adults have been collaborating for a long time, and the kids are getting screwed, and let's be honest about it. John Dacey. Completely agree with my colleague. I also want to point this very similar situation in Los Angeles. So when inside of our union, we're watching new TLA. Um, which is a group of teachers who are beginning to say, the union actually needs to work for me in order to do my job for youth. The, the, the risk of stepping out is going to be, um, as you said, you're gonna put yourself way out there. It's very uncomfortable. I, I just wanna say, so what? We happen to be people of privilege. Our youth are not. This is not about being comfortable. This is about an absolute violation of their right. And we are not gonna be part of violating kids' rights. It's very simple for me. It's, the, it's, it's not just being able to have one or two stand up, it is really the power of the collective. And we can look at what's happened in the last three weeks in Tunisia, and we can look at it in Egypt. It was the power of the collective of Young Voice that rapidly transformed an entire country. How could we not rapidly transform just a school system? I think that can be happening. I actually think a major key to that sits in this room. John, a follow-up for you, and then we're gonna go into um, the, much of the, I'd love to hear from many panelists on this. There is a significant difference of perspective, I would say, even among people who are united around the conviction about our kids' potential and kind of the accountability that we've not demanded of ourselves and our systems for results about the place of teacher unions. Um, and what is kind of the place of teacher unions in this reform effort? And what for the leaders who are trying to drive transformative change, whether it's teachers, school leaders, school superintendents, people in unions trying to drive change, political leaders, what's the right approach do you believe to seeing and working with or not the, our teachers unions in this country, John? So I've only worked in places with teachers unions and labor and, and I think people have a very clear opinion of me that is very true. I have a deep respect for labor, both historically in my own life, uh, my family life and work. Um, 
What I believe, however, is that the, the, the issue of how you work with unions has to be getting them to be courageous about what they want to talk about in the parking lot or what they might want to talk about after you leave the negotiating room to be able to say when it matters. And this kind of whisper con uh, understanding that we have problems, but we need time to solve them, there's no place for that anymore. There simply is no place for that anymore. If labor leader presidents chose any one of our contracts, that is dismissal at will, um, that I think rather than running for office and having to actually get the masses to agree to nothing, I think that actually is going to possibly flip the notion around this. And then second of all is, the membership speaks through one voice, that's just crazy. The membership's voice is not being heard. I'm tired actually of going to schools and people telling me this is what I need and I'm not being heard. Sure you can be heard. You can be heard in many, many ways. I, I, getting that voice present around uh, the people who are actually working side by side with youth is an enormous piece. And second of all is you all vote. You vote for your board you vote for your House of Representatives, and you vote for your school board. That's a piece of power you need to exercise. Michelle, on the teacher union question, some people would say Michelle. that Michelle Rhee has the right approach substantively, but has made the wrong tactical step by demonizing teacher unions, and that diminishes support for the kind of reforms that are needed. What's your perspective on that? So I actually think the exact opposite. I haven't demonized the teachers' unions at all. I have actually, I'm, what I'm trying to do is show people how brilliant the teachers' unions are. The, the, the teachers' unions are doing exactly what they are supposed to do, right? People all the time say to me, how are we gonna change the teachers' unions? How are we going to make them more reform? Or no, we're not going to do it. The teachers' union's job is to protect the rights and pay and privileges and priorities of their members. They, they are doing that. And how do they do that? They have millions of dollars and millions of people and they use those dollars and those people to get the politicians that they want elected and the laws that they want passed and the laws that they don't want blocked. They have, 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 a, have a game plan, they are strategic, they are mobilized, they're doing exactly what they are supposed to do. Our problem is that we are not organized in the same way the unions are. They have a national teachers union, they, the, the locals aren't figuring out what they're doing on their own, everything comes from the national, they're all aligned, they're all consistent. We're out there as education reformers, everyone's out there in their own city, in their own district, trying to do their own thing, we're all trying to make our own game plan up. We are not organized, we, are, we don't have a national agenda that we're pushing all together. And so we actually need to take a, a page from their playbook. And that's part of the reason why I started Students First, is to say we need an organized interest group in this country that has the kind of heft or more heft than the teachers union does because I guarantee you that we have more citizens across this nation who want to do the right thing for children, who want to put the priorities and privileges of children above all else. If we just get ourselves organized, and, and get, get the politicians that we want elected and get the laws that we want passed, I am telling you, we could have a, a hugely transformational impact on this country. The matter is just uh, how, do we mo how do we bring people together? And that's what we're hoping to do through Students First. So can, I, can, I just, can I just jump in on this issue? Because I really think that part of the problem we have in this country is that the union's job is to stop innovation. It's to stop anything that challenges the status quo for folk. And, you know, I wouldn't care about that if the kids were doing fine. I'd be like, you know, fine, who cares? When kids are failing and, and, and you do exactly the same thing for 50 years, even though the results every year is that the kids fail. So you just imagine in your job, you were terrible at your job, right? And you do exactly the same job next year by law. You can't do anything different, right? And then the kids fail, and then that goes over your whole career. You have to realize, people, this has been going on for, I'm 59, it's been going on 50 years. People have spent their whole career failing kids, and that has been the law. You may not change the school day, you may not change the school year. You can't pay people for, for, for being great. When, when the message to young people is no matter how good you are, 
you will make as much as the worst person in that school. I think we got a problem. That is a basic problem, right? So, and, and people think I'm, I'm anti-union. I'm not anti-union. That has nothing, this is not about being anti-union. It's saying if, if you have a history of blocking any kind of innovative reform, anything, uh, then you're the problem and you gotta get out of the way of the problem. And Michelle's right, that's their job. But our job has to be to say to them, uh, you can't get away with that when it comes to kids. So, so we've got, got only a few minutes left. Quick thoughts on this question before we come to a final question. Quick thoughts from Joel and John. So look, I, we gotta talk about what we need to do because they're doing what they're doing just fine and we gotta do something different. Three key things that'll change is first of all, we have got to professionalize teaching and make it the most respected, <laughs> revered profession in this country. We cannot, as Tim Daly and the New Teacher Project, we treat teachers like widgets and that isn't gonna work. Last in, first out, is such a shame you can't say it with a straight face. You think our kids can tolerate a system built on seniority, not on excellence? And every one of us should commit ourselves that excellence in teaching is the hallmark in this country, not seniority in teaching. Second big idea, you wanna talk about innovation? Stop these monopoly providers. Monopoly providers don't innovate. If you get the same number of kids, whether your school is good or bad, yep. you have no incentive to make it better. What drives me nuts, people who try to wrap charter schools. I've got 40,000 parents on waiting lists in New York City for charter schools. The arrogance of others to tell those parents that they shouldn't be on that waiting list and we shouldn't give them more of what they want. We insist on choice for our children. Other people should have choice for theirs. If you didn't have a guaranteed customer base, you would have to earn the children who come to your school. And when you do, you will then earn the outcomes that you get. And the third thing is, let's start to innovate. We have a 19th century delivery model and we keep doing the same old, same old. What Jeff said, we do the same thing every year, hope to get a little more money to do it, get the same damn outcomes, and we don't want to change. How can we continue on that path? John Dacey, where do you... Um, a minute or less, where do you, what do you agree with and what do you disagree with about what you've just heard? I, I strongly agree with the comment that wishing and hoping for something better is not a strategy. It simply is not a strategy. I think we, and we intend to think through this strategy issue very differently. We have just traditionally said, well, let's negotiate. That, that could work. Negotiation has a place. But for us, it's gonna be a four-point strategy around the rights of youth and adults. We're gonna negotiate, we're gonna regulate through policy, we're gonna legislate and we're gonna litigate. And the four points of this are that none of the traditional tactics alone have moved us where we're gonna be. So when we have true violation, we're not gonna hope for it to get better, we're gonna to go to the courts. When we believe that there are laws that are fundamentally blocking our opportunity, we are gonna to go to the Capitol. And traditionally we've let others do that for us, not any longer. Not when it's our responsibility for kids and we're gonna demand others stand up around that, that strategy. John, quick, if somebody said, you know what, that sounds good, but it's not focused and clear enough about who are the problems, where the problems are, and it may, not, it may lead to incremental change, not dramatic change in LA schools, what would you say to that? Okay. Let me be super clear for you then. So we're talking about uh, quality blind layoffs, first in, first out, with any regard whatsoever to performance. We're talking about meaningful tenure reform. We are talking about dramatically changing the way that we do performance management and, and um, evaluation for everybody in the system, uh, principals and teachers. And we're talking about the opportunity to fundamentally pay our best and brightest employees dramatically more. Differentiated compensation for differentiated results. I, I think that's pretty specific. Uh, Dave Levin, we're gonna, we're gonna wrap this with you. Um, um, the KIPP schools. Yeah. You, you um, don't have some of the policy constraints that are in school systems. You've been working hard to build your pipeline of leadership. You've got some amazing educators. Um, how easy is it? And how easy is it to scale? And looking at the people in this room, leader to leader, 
what is the most important thing that you've learned about what it takes to get the kind of transformative success that you've gotten to greater and greater scale? So, um, the screen says wrap, so briefly. Uh, <laughs> this is the hardest work on the planet. Um, it's also the most important. And to scale, uh, we need everything that the other panelists have been talking about, but we can never ever forget that the unit of change for an individual kid's life, the transformational place where everything happens is school. It starts with and ends with school. It starts in pre-K, it goes straight through college. And we need the broader systemic change and then we need as many committed, as many talented, as many revolutionary teachers and school leaders as this nation can produce. And I think of the power of an individual teacher and where I would end today, there are 27,000 kids in KIPP schools. Next year will be my 20th year. So in that essence, I've given a generation to this. I hope to give two more generations. Uh, the change has to come quicker for our individual lives. A generation ago, I met Harriet Ball. She passed this week. And just in closing, I'd ask for three seconds of silence for the power of a teacher. So the, with that, I, the most powerful message that I've heard for this room, one, who is up here has actually been totally driven by who has gotten transformative and dramatic results. Your power to get dramatic results, equipping you to get results at greater scale, advocacy, political policy change, education change, may be the most single greatest thing you have in your power in order to reuse your power well for systems change, for political advocacy, for everything. And the second thing I've heard from this is stick with it. This is not, this is not gonna go in a year. This is gonna take a generation, not a year. So whether you stay where you are, whether you go to LA to help John Dacey drive a form in LA, whether you go to Harlem Children's Zone and make that even more of a national model than the great national model today, whether you sign up for Students First to help advocate for the kind of change, whether you go to KIPP schools across the country, whether you go to New York City to build on the reforms there, whether you go to New Leaders for New Schools before our February 21st deadline to become a school leader <laughs> in our schools. The point is, whether you go to any of our places or where you are, stick with this, and in 10 years, the changes that have happened in the past decade will seem small compared to the seismic changes that are possible. But if you don't stick with it, the change will not happen. We've got the final comment before we close from Jeff Canada. Thank you. I, I, was, I, I was worried that I wouldn't get this final comment because this is, this is what I heard. And now I've always heard this for, for Teach for America. The smartest people, right, in their graduating classes from the best colleges in the country, which I accept. What I want to know is, were you all nice people? And this is why. There's 10, 11,000 people. Each one of you must have 10 friends. So to me, that's 11, that's, a, that's 100,000 people. We need you to be the army. We can, we can do house parties around waiting for Superman, radicalize America. You've got your own people here that need your support. I will be disappointed if Michelle doesn't tell me I got 100,000 new, I don't care if it's a dollar, I don't care if it's a dollar, that there's an army of people out there prepared to work, not talk. Get 10 people, support Kip, support Michelle, let's get this revolution on. So, so let's, we're, we're all gonna sit here for a moment as Elisa Delanueva comes up to speak, but before we do that, let's give a huge hand to this remarkable panel of leaders. <laughs>